Ladies and gentlemen, we got a good episode for you today. We talk a little bit about the lake effect in Toronto. Dax putting in a 90 minute shift, how the old man's legs fared over the weekend. We got to cut through a little bit of the red tape with the U.S. men's national team and what's going on with Jesse Marsh and Greg Berhalt. They're a little bit, uh, a little dicey. There's there's something there. And and was Gio Reyna, was it an obvious to bring him into camp? Was it a no-brainer or was it the right call? Was it a stroke of genius by Greg Berhalter? And apparently, we are thanked for our professionalism in the ongoing saga that is uh, pro referees and Major League Soccer. And today, this morning, uh, we are through with the replacements and the good guys get back to work. Let's dive right in. What's the toughest part about being a journeyman in a new city? Well, Gordo, you know this as well as I do. Being a journeyman in a new city or a city that you're staying in is always difficult. The uncertainty of the future. Are you going to stay? Are you going to go somewhere else? Back in 2020 with Nashville SC, when we had a brand new team, everyone coming to a new city, there was only one person that we trusted to get our real estate needs done. And that's Erin Mishu with Fikes Realty Group. She made everything perfect, flawless, seamless. We had absolutely no issues getting into our house here in Nashville and all my teammates felt the same way. You can check Aaron out at majorleague-realestate.com. Major League journeyman. I, Daniel Gargan, am fresh off a rejuvenated week in the sunshine, Florida. Dax, you know all about that. I got Dax McCarty and Alan Gordon. Alan, you look like you are, I don't know if I've actually ever called you Alan. That was really weird. Um, that is Alan weird. Gordon. Don't do that again. Um, Alan, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> you look like you are in Toronto, but I know that you're up in the mountains getting getting snowed on. Is that is that accurate? Is that an accurate assessment? Very you brought accurate. your mustache. Brought your mustache. Very with accurate. You? I'm uh, growing this thing out. Um, <laughs> you are fully it's, committed, it's, which I'm proud of. It looks good. Yeah, getting some skiing in. No, it does and not. It does not look good. <laughs> Gordo, it looks great. Are you more looking forward to the actual act of skiing and snowboarding, or are you looking more for apres ski? So, Dax, I am a apres wild ski guy. So I, <laughs> okay, so I bring the apri to the mountain, and there's nothing better than hitting a run and then getting on the chair and cracking a nice cold bruise. I'm pretty sure yeah, you just no. invented a new term, an apres <laughs> during ski guy. <laughs> That is, that is he just coined a new phrase. <laughs> There's well, got to be a T-shirt out there somewhere with that on it. I'm sure Sonny Bono would be thrilled to hear you say that. Who is just, no it longer makes with absolutely us. zero sense considering I think after <laughs> you post after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, uh, not for me brother not, not for me brother oh my god well it, it, it yeah i'm sure you're about to jump into the snow and have some fun dax i know that you guys were in toronto which can have some pretty comparable conditions gordo we've both been uh a part of that you remember is that the coldest place that you've ever played toronto uh, I was trying to I was trying to think that, you know, as I was watching Dax's game, you know how bone chilling it is. It's like a cold. It's a wet, cold and like the wind, you know, Chicago for me, Chicago. That was one of the most miserable years of my life, because the <laughs> first like the first two months with the wind in Chicago, I don't know if you can beat it, but Toronto on those days, it can be right next to the lake, all that kind of stuff it can be awful as well. And so both places, it's kind of like 1A, 1B for me, but they're they're both terrible. Dax, Toronto or Chicago? Because you just you just played there. It was pretty it looked pretty cold. But I Chicago would say, I would say in general, Chicago is colder, but yeah. for some reason, Toronto, it goes through these like little temper tantrums where it just gets excruciatingly cold. And like yeah. I remember t- 2010. Uh, FC Dallas. Oh yeah, you were playing. Colorado Rapids MLS. Cup. I was at that game. I was in the fact, stands, not running around, and it was brutal, awful. And fun fact: that was actually the last MLS Cup that was played at a neutral site. Yeah. And For I good think reason. it surprised me that MLS changed that rule after that game because it was like everyone was. <laughs> Whoever made that decision is definitely no longer with. One hundred percent. Actually, they've probably been promoted. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta say, like. Man, we we get there and our well before we get there. First of all, our flight was delayed for like three hours because it was just dumping. Snow oh, MLS 2.0 problems. I'm sorry to hear that, Dax. Now oh, that you're flying you're on Boeing 737, you're on your private uh, jet. All just we're delayed. a 
were, we were the strawberries the not chilled, you sweetheart? Oh my God. We, were, we were in the executive lounge, all right, at the airport, first of all, uh, um, eating our peanut butter and jellies. And we were so like the delay, it is what it is, but the snow was supposed to clear up. And it actually was like a beautiful day all the way leading up to the game. And it was just cold. But I think the one thing you hit on, Gordo, was the wind. I, it, you don't realize it, but the state BMO stadium, it's, it's right on the water. And it's so, right on the lake. It's the wind just. Dude, Toronto, cold. for me, Toronto's the coldest. It's Dude. by far the coldest. So, it's frigid how cold that wind makes you get, especially if there's like, if there's any precipitation, any rain whatsoever, it is awful, brutal. Is. And so look, the, the conditions, like it's not an excuse. Like we lost the game 2-0, Toronto was the better team, but I, the conditions were were miserable for both teams. But I think the conditions did play into the game a little bit in terms of the wind and some of the tactics that were employed. And it, it honestly, it caught me off guard a little bit, the way Toronto played. You guys know I've, I've given them props with Herdman and, and what he's done um, to kind of shift their focus and their mentality from a team that conceded a million goals last year in the last couple of years to now a team that's like very committed, very hard to break down. And I knew they would be, but one little tactical shift that I didn't, we didn't expect was that they, they just went man for man all over the field. And that was like very reminiscent of like the San Jose earthquakes with dude with who were a lot of fun to watch play, to be fair. And, and it's miserable to play against, especially, right. you know, if, if you're not ready for it. And so for me, I was thinking, okay, they're going man v man all over the field within the first half with the wind, you, you're trying to play more direct because you want to try to get your attacking players into one V one situations. And so every pass you hit, it's skimming uh -huh. off the turf because it's ice. It's all pretty much iced over, so it's skim skimming out of bounds, and they're pressing us high, high, high. Second half, you know, we try to adjust a little bit. We're trying to play a little bit more. We try to play them behind, and the wind is just holding the ball up, so you can't even get behind them even if you wanted to. And so, you know, it, it did have a small effect on the game, and quite honestly, um, you know, Toronto, they played well, and they pressed well, and defensively, you, you have to give them a lot of credit. They are very organized. They're very committed, and they are a, a team that, especially in Toronto, especially coming off a loss, it looked like, you know, that they were going to come, and they knew that we had some changes, right? We made, I think we had six six changes from the lineup uh, from the first three games, where the first three games we started mm -hmm. the exact same team. And I think mm -hmm. we'll get into this a little bit later, but with the international call-ups, right, we're missing guys. And, and I think we have great depth. And um, you, you just, when you don't play, right, with with guys in real games that matter for, for a few weeks, you, you just miss those little connections, right? And those little yep. connections that you need on the field between your attacking players, between your defenders and your midfielders. Um, you know, we had moments in the game where we took a little bit of control. We had some good spells of possession. We, we just couldn't quite turn that into... Uh, dangerous goal scoring opportunities. Right. And so for me, that was the story of the game. Um, Bernadeschi was on fire. He was fair. So you said that, and you said Insigne was, was really good too. And we've talked a little bit about this um, in previous episodes. And I know that you kind of mentioned it off camera um, is what's your opinion now on Herbin having seen his group in person and now getting these guys playing yeah. like the superstars that I think everybody was expecting them to be. I saw something funny on, on it might've been on Twitter or I'm not sure where on MLSsoccer.com. I don't know, but I saw that like Insigne had a quote where he said he was, he was talking to Herdman more than he talks to his wife. And yeah, yeah I saw that. Yeah. I found that, I found that to be obviously very tongue in cheek, but quite humorous, but it, it, it might ring true just considering the buy-in that these guys have right now. And it's a shame Insigne, he actually went off injured right before halftime, but to see the tactical discipline and organization that they have, to see Insigne Bernadeschi buying into what they're trying to do offensively, I mean, I think it's been pretty clear that they're very talented players going forward. But I think the question was always, are they going to care when it comes to defending on the other side of the ball? Are they going to buy into what the team ethos is? And Herdman, he's got them bought in. And then if you put pieces around them, that'll carry the water for them and, and make sure they, you know, you put them in good positions – Look what Insigne has done. He's only scored two or three absolute golosos to, to get them points already this year. And Bernadeschi yeah. hasn't scored, but he was the best player on the field. He was the most dangerous player on the field. And those guys, they're paid a pretty penny to do that, right? And so mm -hmm. um, for me, like even at 1-0, we were down 1-0. You know, we were in the game. We weren't playing great, but we were in the game. And, and we had a couple half chances 
to maybe get back in the game and equalize. And when you don't take your chances, especially on the road, and you let a team like Toronto, who I think they were, you know, growing in confidence, their crowd was really into it. When, when you let them hang around, they get the second goal, then it's always an uphill battle, right? So frustrating to lose and, and unfortunate because it was, you know, of me and a bunch of guys first starts of the season, we really wanted to make a good impression. And but for the most part, we played okay. We just weren't weren't quite sharp enough to be able to get uh, back in the game and, and, you know, potentially take a point or three points from Toronto. So, you yeah. know, your wounds, you learn from it, and you you take your hat off. Toronto was was yeah. very good on the night. Gordo, you had a thought run across your mustache. What what were you thinking there? <laughs> I, I did. I did. I saw – I want to go back to those comments. Um, I I When I read that, I thought – Initially, I was just like, that's that's kind of weird. Like, how much is too much? I think I think it's working for him because he's got him bought in and he's obviously taking his advice on on, you know, some tactical, you know, some some ideas that he has. And and he kind of he kind of stated that. But how much is too much for a coach to be talking to a player like that is is too much too much too much i think it goes one of two ways right like they're going to build a relationship and it's either going to be really good and continue in a really good place until it goes bad and it may go bad like you, you know like at some point insignia is going to have some type of thought and i don't know if you know if herman is necessarily taking coaching direction from him I, my guess is they're they're building a rapport because insignia is arguably the most important player on the team which like I think that you can probably you, you can sympathize with this. You've played with some players that kind of sit in a different stratosphere. I have as well. I remember all those players. Preferential treatment is probably a little bit strong, but really not that far off in terms of what your relationships, your your coach. I feel like coaches always have right. different relationships with their best players. It, because they have to, they're expected. They're expecting different things from them, which means they treat them differently. A am I wrong there? Facts. And you know what it looks like to me? No, you're right. And it looks like to me that Herdman, he came in and it looks like it was a very simple conversation. He probably had a, sat down with both the DPs and said, look, do you want to be here? Yes or no? If right. answer, That's an easy starting point, right? If the answer is yes, great starting point. Now, what do you prefer? How do you want us to play? How can I get the most out of you? Because if I get the most out of you two, my two best players, then our team, that's a great foundation for success. And yeah. if you tell them that and they don't deliver or they don't perform, boom, out of the team or you switch up your tactics, whatever you need to do. Now, like you said, it's, it's worked up until this point and he has buy-in from both of them. They look very sharp. It's unfortunate and Senior got injured, but for the most part, it's worked. What my question will be is when that shiny new new car smell, when that wears off and they go through a little bit of adversity, whether that right. is injury related, whether that is, hey, you know, uh, teams have a little bit of tape on how we're going to play and what we want to do. And now maybe it's not so rosy. Like, do you still have buy in when the times are tough? It's easy to buy in and be happy and positive when everything's going great. When, when it's at wrong, a start from exactly. the start. Right. And, right. And, and Herdman is being super positive and, and there's a lot of really good momentum for them. I'll, you know, I'll be curious to see how it works out for them when things change. I think it, it going through adversity shows the true character of anybody. So it, it, it'll, it will look different at whatever point that is, who knows. Um, but getting the buy-in from the outset is seemingly what Toronto and, and Herdman have done. Um, at least from from those two guys, which you have to have your best players be your best players in, in order to succeed in this league. Speaking, that, of, speaking of best players, this is a question that I wanted to ask you because obviously I have some thoughts on it, but I think it speaks to, I think, kind of where MLS is at the moment. And, um, you know, let me just be very clear here. Like, I think MLS rosters are better than they've ever been. They're deeper than they've ever been. But I, I still think at the moment – you need your best players if you're gonna if you're gonna be able to compete and win games. And I think mm -hmm. this towards MLS's calendar and, and the schedule. You know, we made six changes to our team going into Toronto because we had six guys on international duty, and that mm -hmm. was youth national team guys with Almada and Caleb Wiley who were going for Olympic team duty. And then yep. you know you're missing uh, Bartosz Schlich, um, you're missing Georgios Jakamakis. Yep. Uh, Steon Gregerson was an injury, so that's different. Um, and then a Johnny Fortune with, with Trinidad. So, you know, you're missing a, a really 
big part of your team and MLS is continuing to play through these international breaks. I think a few teams were off. Um, mm-hmm. I think, did you guys see that, you know, the New York Red Bulls and inner Miami, there was something that came out before the game where they tried to reschedule, they tried right? to reschedule the game and the MLS said no. So I, I'm, I'm just wondering, right? Because I think this is a big question that fans have. What is a solution for that? Do you guys think MLS because of the congested calendar should still play through international breaks and, and teams that have a lot of international players, like, sorry, like, hopefully your depth is good enough or Mm -hmm. you think they should figure out different ways, whether that's more midweek games to take breaks during international days, because quite frankly, like I I think fans want to know how the supporter shield and, and, you know, right. Making the playoffs. A lot of teams make the playoffs. I get it. Right. But at the same time, you know, some teams and some fans might feel like, Hey, like, you know, all these international breaks, if we're playing through them, that's four or five, game days where we don't have our best players and that starts Mm -hmm. to affect us during the season. So I'm curious your guys' thoughts on that. I, where I go to with that question, Dax, and I think I take it back actually to maybe a a differing of opinion between the two of us, um, because it, it, it kind of reminds me of coaches. And I think we were actually talking about Bob Bradley specifically and Toronto FC, where he was referencing missing players due to injury. And you were saying, I, I, and I'm paraphrasing now, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that your position was, hey, you need your players on the field and he has a right to complain about that. Where I, I think my position was, you're going to deal with this. Every team goes through it and yeah. it is what it is. And it's why, why your roster is your roster, right? So... I think I kind of sit still sit in that place as in like this puts a little bit more attention and emphasis on the GMs to do a good job in building and constructing a roster. It puts a little bit more attention on the youth development. It puts a little bit more attention on what your actual micro and macro cycles look like from a curricular, from a workload standpoint, a periodization standpoint, where you're going to implement giving guys minutes and signing a Dax McCarty and expecting him to perform at a level that Dax McCarty can perform at. And I think that all of those things kind of lead me to uh, no, like yeah, you, you should play, play the games. You should yeah. play the games and on international break, you're, you're at a, you're at a quote unquote loss because you're losing a messy, which is a, an yeah. irreplaceable piece, but you have 30 guys on a roster for a reason. And you have yeah. all of this, play your kids, all this other, you know, all the nonsense that kind of the pundits talk about, but I do think that it's why clubs are spending more in their infrastructure, spending more on the roster, spending more in kind of putting these players in position because you're now in a position to kind of see this. I don't think you haven't always been this in your career, but now you're a second choice for the time being, right? So I've been that. And I know that I've looked towards international windows, any real windows, injuries, whatever, to get an opportunity to get on the field. And I think that you get a different player when that happens you get a player that needs to prove himself right because you have to get you have to take advantage of the minutes that you get and i think that from a fan perspective now while of course i want to see messi and i want to see you know the game's best and brightest stars that are away with international duty because they've earned that i also want to see what's coming up next i want to see the 17 year old that's the fill-in i want to see the backup guy and see what he can do and it's that's just Maybe it's not just as interesting, but I think it's interesting to a point where I'm engaged in the game. I'm engaged in seeing something different. Maybe I won't see the type of magic and brilliance that a Messi can deliver, but I will see another point of the club that I'm supporting. I agree with you, Dan. I agree with you 100%. And look, for me, it also speaks to right roster building and the types of players that you go after and how different teams build in different ways, right? If Atlanta United is building a certain way where – you know, they have these young internationals or maybe some established internationals from maybe some smaller countries who you're going to lose. Then you look at a Nashville and they they only lose Jacob Schaffelberg and Anibal Godoy, right? They lose two players while as we lose five or six, it just speaks to the different ways and mechanisms you can build your roster. But I agree hundred percent. Like you should be able to test your depth in these moments. And I think that guys like myself who still feel like we have plenty to prove, that's an opportunity to get on the field and show, hey, I can mm-hmm. still do this at a high level. For a 17-year-old or a player who might not get an opportunity with a Tiago Almada who is going to play every minute of every game, right? Like a Nick yep. Firmino, 
This was a wonderful opportunity for him to step on the field in a hard environment and say, hey, yep. man, what do you have? What do you got? And so I do agree with you. Uh, I, I like it. I think it tests everyone in the club from top to bottom, from the GM to the roster build to the coaching staff to then the players who, you know, who haven't gotten big minutes who need to step up and actually show that we can go and get results when the, you know, the, the internationals aren't there. So, look, I thought it was, for the most part, a, a, a good performance for us, and it just was an unfortunate result. And, look, you you really start to, to get that taste of, hey, these young guys or these guys that haven't played as many minutes, you want to get on the field. You want to keep proving mm-hmm. yourself. And try to, when, when everyone's back, you, you make the coach's decision harder, man. Gordo, mm-hmm. you're, you're back and joining us after your technical day. Oh, hey, guys. Hey, yeah, buddy. computer just wanted to shut down there for a second. Uh, I'm going to, hey, I'm going to take Alan. The- I'm going to take the other side of this, guys. I'm going to take the other side. And I'll tell you why. Because it's kind of like it, when, I, when I think about like the NBA, right? NBA is built off superstars. And as a, as a fan perspective, if, 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 if the Lakers are coming into my town, I want to see, I want to see LeBron play. I want to mm-hmm. see these guys play. I want to see the stars play. I want to see Messi play. So mm-hmm. I think that they're as, and you alluded to this, uh, uh, Dax. Is things are changing? Our league is changing, right? right. And there's a re- there's a reason why, like the Premier League, for example, they have international breaks because sure. they wouldn't have a team. They wouldn't they have lose, a team they to lose play their entire roster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And so as the MLS continues to go in this trajectory, I think there's going to you're going to be forced to make some of these changes because as we get better and better and better players that are representing their countries, I think no matter how you build the roster, and and I, I do agree with you guys, right? I, I like it for the time being, but there's a, the other side is as we get builder and the league grows, we might have to do it because you might lose 10 guys. You know sure, what I'm yeah. saying? So No, I think that's a, I think that's a valuable point. I But I don't think we're there yet. I don't think no, we're, we're there not. yet where, where you need to stop stop games um just because of international games but we did go just go through one and i want to shift gears um and talk about the u.s men's national team and i i want to throw this point blank black and white gordo i'm going to throw it to you the walking contradiction fence straddler has greg secured his position through this cycle yes okay that's a good starting point dax do you agree no. Disagree. No. I, disagree. Oh, I love it. Okay, good. I, I got both sides of the fence here. Gordo, <clears throat> is this championship a meaningful championship against Mexico? And does the game against Jamaica or the game against Mexico tell you more about this team? Uh, yes, it it is meaningful. It's, it's always meaningful anytime we step on the field against Mexico. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's the best rivalry, and you know that we know of in, mm-hmm. in our country, and in, in us being soccer players, this is this is it. And what a, I mean, just because they're not where they used to be, isn't it fun to watch us kick the shit out of them? Like I we hate Mexico. I hate Mexico. I, and I, as a country, I love it, but Mexican soccer, I and I respect the hell out of it. Let me be. Let me be more clear because I respect Mexican players so much and the way that they're lead the teams all of it but i despise nothing more than them yeah totally so so i i really and i enjoyed the fact that we were matched up against them in the final and we dominated them we kicked the shit out of them we we dominated all three phases of the game in my opinion we saw some guys really balling out we saw you know this 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 reina thing is is just it's so mm-hmm. intriguing. Play. Every time he steps on, he wins player. He he wins the player of the tournament. And now Greg looks like he looks like I'm not going to say a genius, but he looks like he was correct, right? And, and all was, was there well, before you go on there because we're I was going to touch on this, but like in your mind, was there really any question of bringing Geo into the camp or putting him on the team, putting yeah. him on the sheet? He there he's was not getting any. He's not getting any quality minutes. I, lo- I not, love that you took playing. this side because you are an idiot. Yeah. He's not playing, dude. That's a good point. So who cares? But, but 
How how many the, how many guys how cares. many guys throughout the world no don't no, play wrong, or wrong, don't have good wrong. club situations and then they also get called into their national team and ball out. I seem to so remember a couple of years ago Christian Pulisic wasn't really playing that much for Chelsea. And guess what? He used the You're not going to call him in in the international break to bring him in and he could find his form then. There's a big difference between Christian and Reyna. There's, there's not a big, a big, big there's not, not a big really. difference. Yes, there is. Alan, not that, a big difference. At that point in time, yes, there was because he was, he he's more proven. He's done more things. Cla- Claudio, or not Claudio, his son is, is Gio. Gio. He is, he's, he's still young. He doesn't have this vast. Uh, he and is still young. That, dude, he's the best he's player young, on the field. He, dude, tell, tell me. Maybe at 1B behind Christian. Pulisic's the best player I'm on the not, field. This is not a debate on whether or not he's good. The, the, okay, it's every coach wants their players to be playing in their, and they want them to be fit and playing and playing. Of well course, for the, the right. ideal he, scenario is that I he's just playing said games. that, and Absolutely. you guys were arguing with me about it. That's why you could you could question him bringing him in because unless I'm unless I'm wrong, he's not getting a lot of quality minutes for his club. He's not playing correct? at all. He's not, he's not no, playing he's at all. Not, he's not playing at all. He's still the one B option in our team. We, for yes. me, listen, I, for our team, the USA right now. Yes. Correct. He's good enough to be, to call him in, but you could argue that he, he, that he wouldn't bring him in because he's not playing again, you know? So like there's, this, it's always been a requirement or, or a want from coaches how do they know if he's even fit enough? How do they know? Dude, it's a I, I, they have, they have well, it's these not, conversations it's not constantly. It has, it has been, yes, it has been a want of coaches for their best players or all their players to be playing minutes. Obviously, when your best players aren't playing heavy minutes for their club team, you're still going to bring them in because you know how to utilize them. You know how to get the best out of them. You know they're rested. Does he? That's for sure. He didn't play them in the last World Cup cycle. So, like, you know, this is what I'm saying. It's okay, not like they. Years ago, buddy. Come on now. People evolve. People grow. I I get it. Okay, I'm so Gordo. Saying... All right, Gordo. So do you think that? Do you think that this was a case of him pulling him in because of the the damaged relationship? Maybe. Ah. <laughs> Maybe. No way. Maybe. Come on, dude. Uh, Maybe. Oh yeah. You are. Oh my God. Put your tinfoil hat on, dude. Get Maybe. your conspiracy theories out. Come on. Oh Come my buddy. God. No. Daddy loves you. Hey, Daddy still loves you. Your club <laughs> doesn't, but Daddy does. Come on in. You're uh, safe with me. Come on. Geo. Geo was awesome. I thought yeah. in both games, and for me, if I'm Greg, I, there's no risk in bringing him in. There's a reward, 100 percent reward, and it doesn't have anything to do with the damaged relationship. I thought it was a little odd that he specifically mentioned him in the post game after Jamaica, where he, you know, him and Marsh are are def- There's something going on there, which is something interesting. But I, I don't, I don't. There was, there's never a question of bringing Geo into a camp. Geo's phenomenal, phenomenal. On he's, the field, he's proven at this point he is one of, if not the best player that we have to be able to call on. Yes. Hey, listen, listen. He 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 proved him. He proved him right, and he made that decision look good. But what if? What if he didn't perform? What if he went out and he well, wasn't you good? Ask, you could ask. Here, here's yeah. You know here's, what I mean? Would a, here's be, a we would have. I don't we would th- be having a different conversation. But you're playing Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> and you've already seen the whole thing play out. You're like, yeah, why wouldn't you bring him in? Oh, no, why course. wouldn't why wouldn't you bring him in? And it, there's there's no there's no way that Geo is going to be any less than an absolute star in our World Cup squad in 2026. He Absolutely. in order for us to be successful, he has to be phenomenal. There's Absolutely. no reason why you wouldn't bring him in to this camp just because he's not playing games. I agree with you. You of course want your players to play games, but I also think that that's a way for coaches to hide. That's a way for coaches to hide behind their decisions and say, "Oh, well you're not playing over here, so I can't bring you in. So I'm going to bring this guy in." blah 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 blah. It's a motivating factor for sure. But I don't th- no, not with Geo, dude. There's there's no risk there, especially with this because I also uh, we have so many competitions now. So while I think it is really important to play games against Mexico and to win against Mexico, I do think that that is significantly valuable. That trophy or whatever it is, the champions whatever, 
nation. Not, th- th- who cares? Who cares? Yeah. But no, playing no. against Mexico and beating Mexico consistently is a big deal. And yeah, that is something that. that is always valuable. It is I a big deal. Do you, do you know what's unfortunate for the U.S. is that in Copa America and in the World Cup, they can't play Mexico every game. Yeah. And that is a problem. For me, <clears throat> the Jamaica game was alarming. And let me let me first say that I've been on the record as been supporting Greg Berhalter as the coach. I think I put a lot of stock in what players say publicly, what players say privately, how they interact with him. And let's mm-hmm. put the Gio Reyna situation in the World Cup aside for a second. The team loves Greg. That's a fact. You cannot fact. argue. That is a fact. And they love yeah. him because... You know, I, I think he's more of a modern day players coach. You know, he tries to, you know, get to the more personal side of the player. He's not just an X's and O's guys. He, you know, wants to try to relate to them in different ways. And I think players. He's a he's got a lot of Bruce in him in terms of player management. Now, with that being said, the Jamaica game was alarming. It's not easy when you concede an early goal to break down an organized 5-4-1 block. It's, it's not, yeah. okay? So I'm not yeah. trying to minimize the difficult task that is. We were, we, the, how lucky the U.S. got to win that game and to tie that game is insane. I, I don't know what the Vegas odds would be at that moment in time for a guy on Jamaica to head the ball into his own net. And look, for the most part, yes, there was a, a little flick from Miles at the near post. And by and large, if you ran that corner kick play and did that 100 times, 99 times out of 100, the ball is getting cleared. And the refs blow on the whistle, and the U.S. is out of the Nations League, okay? So let's make sure we understand what a fine margin that is. And so the U.S. did not look good. Every time they play Mexico, they look great because Mexico stinks and we're up for it and we have a better team. We have better players. My question is, why can't we look like that? Why don't we look like that against other opposition, especially other CONCACAF opposition? And let's also not minimize the fact that, like, Greg has been put in some pretty advantageous situations. I don't – does the U.S. only play national team games in the U.S.? I don't yes. remember them ever playing a game outside the U.S. the last couple of years, right? I'm just sitting here yeah. trying to wrap Well, up if you work. remember Don Garber, it, we are the ATM of uh, <laughs> world I, football. I still, don't, I still don't know what that means. But I'm, I'm just trying to make a point that you asked initially, is Greg's position safe through the World Cup? I, I don't think it is because while I do think that he is the right coach to lead this team, I think that a poor Copa America still – puts question marks and doubts in people's minds and players' minds about can he get the best out of this team when we're not playing CONCACAF opposition? That is still a question mark that I have, and I don't know if we're going to have the answer until Copa America. That's Well, we got a lot of games, right, Dax? We do have a lot of games, and I think your point is valid to a degree in terms of playing all the games in the U.S., but here's the reality. We're playing Copa America in the U.S., and we're playing the World Cup in the U.S., so it really doesn't matter. You know, It doesn't, doesn't, but you would like to see – for me, I would like to see this team put through a little bit more adversity. I'd like to see them play – I don't don't disagree with that. I'd like to see them play better teams if it is on U.S. soil, and look, I think they're playing Brazil coming up here in the next uh, in the next couple months. Yeah. I think in Uruguay, right? Windows. Or um, Uruguay and Colombia? I, I think so. I mean, it's not for a lack of trying. Like I think the US is trying to put really difficult games on the on, they played on the Germany. Top, on the they got spanked by Germany. So here's my thing. I think Greg is the right guy to lead this team because the team believes in Greg. I think you should put a lot of stock in what players believe and what players want. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, I still think there's question marks regarding how he sets this team up tactically. Like uh, against against Mexico in the first half, why is Gio Reyna Mm -hmm. getting the ball off your center backs? Why is he the one that's coming deep to try to maybe make the game a little bit when you want him higher up the field creating chances? Like I I just – there are certain things tactically where I ask myself, what does – like what does Greg see? What does he want to see from this team? How does he get the best out of the best players on this team? And I think I think that goes back. I think I think you bring up a lot of good points, Dax. I think it goes back to bringing Geo in regardless, because the more reps that you get with your best players, that the better you're going to get. Do I think that he's got it all tactically figured out in terms of the right approach? 
I don't know. I, I would have to say that judging by the performance against Jamaica, which is a really difficult side to break down sure. in a low box, that's not that's not easy to do. And maybe they didn't even deserve to get to the final, which is fair. But they got there, right? Like you still, you always need a little help in any game. You're never going <laughs> to minimize and diminish winning trophies. Look, they got to the final by mer- some miraculous play, and guess what? They spanked Mexico again. Which, yeah, mm-hmm. this trophy, the Nations League, okay, like. It's a little bit hooey, and guess what? It's just another glorified. Dude, I'd give him a trophy just for spanking Mexico. We should just for keep. Sure. We should hand out trophies for that because that is a big deal. <laughs> it and is. That's it a- is, and no one should take away from that, and sh- no one should minimize that. But the journeymen have also discussed how poor this Mexico team is for a number, like since the inception of this podcast, it's been the worst Mexico team that we've seen. So, so here's, here's what I know about Mexican players, or at least what my perception is that a lot of it is mental with them. And if they feel great and they feel confident going into a game, they are going to crush you and bring every wave of intent and pressure and technical execution at you over and over and over again. If you break their psyche, then there seems to be a window where they all start pointing fingers and they don't know what's going on and they they just start yapping at each other, right? So yeah, this might be a weak, a weaker Mexican federation, but if we keep kicking their ass, that's going to sit with them for a long time. And it's going to sit in the back of their brains about coming and playing the U.S. And here we go again. We're going to get our heads handed to us. I don't I think, think there's we've another... lost, I don't think we've lost a, a, a an, an official game to them for like five years. Something crazy. Yeah. So that so where where my head went when Gargs and I, you you bring up a lot of I think there's always been questions with Burhalter and some of the performances he comes out he's it's very up sure. and down uh, which yep. is which is the way he's always been right stick which stick is also to, kind of weird isn't it Gordo because I feel like with Burhalter like I loved watching his teams play with the crew. Uh, like right. I, I loved it and I loved right. playing against them because it was tough, but I also knew that you're going to get a beautiful game and they played and even after a cover as a commentator, like I loved yeah. watching him play. I can't say I love watching our US team I, play. I agree. But I, the, the only thing that I was gonna, where my head went was, can you imagine if they fired him and then hired him? And then fired him again before the World <laughs> Cup. Like and, and that that's the only thing I thought of. And that's why I was like, yes, he's a hundred percent safe because but you know, who who knows? They might they might do it and you're and we'll be shaking our heads again. Like what I don't I, I think to to Dan's original question, like there should be questions asked, but I don't think he's under any real pressure. Right. Right. What's going right. on with him and Marsh? Because that seems somewhat odd. Wow. I, I, Obviously, uh, tension there. It, it, there tension. is, and it, I mean, this goes back. Got to go back to like the Galaxy Chivas days, right? I mean, doesn't it? Didn't wouldn't it go back there where it first started to be? I mean, Marsh, fiery competitor, Burhalter, fiery competitor, and there there was some bite there for sure. And now it's kind of I don't. I read through. I didn't listen to their podcast whatever um one that marsh is on now um but i didn't read some of the comments can we get some clarification is jesse is he a a a, a full-time member of the media these days or is he gonna is he trying to coach again what's going on here he's doing he's doing the media circuit right should we have him on the journeyman to like confirm or deny is he just waiting for the right opportunity it's a good good point jesse marsh get on get in here by by leads or something you know and he's just kind of making his rounds Dude, I I thought so. Listen, I I saw the clip of him on the podcast and him saying that. I didn't I didn't take it like Burholzer did, but it but it definitely bugged Burholzer. And I think that this is yeah. He showed like a kink in his armor, you know, because he's yeah. always very composed and he's confident and he sticks by his guns. Maybe it's all just kind of getting to him, and he just he showed a little bit of weakness. By the way, Jesse is a bold faced liar. This dude. If presented with the opportunity to coach the national team, oh yeah, hundred percent consider no question in my mind. No. He was asked, "Oh, do you do you are you interested in that job?" He I don't said, want that job. I don't want that job. You are yeah. lying through your teeth. Liar. You know what? I think he prefers to stay in Europe. First of all, hundred percent. And I think Jesse's at the point in his career where he's going to pick and choose, like kind of the right moment and opportunity for him. If by some miracle, whatever. And, we all want the U S to be successful, but if for some reason they weren't and Greg was gone and they offered Jesse that job, he would absolutely consider it and 
I think he would take it depending on Dude, where we were in the cycle. But I think you're absolutely right, Dax. I think it's easy for Jesse to say that because he knows he's got no shot at getting it right now. There's oh, there's zero point zero percent chance yes, they're moving I on agree. from Greg unless if a catastrophic meteor hits his house <laughs> and Jesse's not up for the running. They already passed him over, so yeah. it's it's right. easy. That that is easy. I do think we we didn't touch on this, but I do think. The mentality you guys talked about, Dax, you were talking about kind of the mentality of not playing Mexico, right? I thought the first 20, 25 minutes of that game against Mexico, though, I also saw what the difference that Tyler Adams does to that team. His whole just approach is it, it completely changes the complexion and the attitude of that of that group. A hundred, a hundred percent. So that's another piece that I think is is really kind of underrated within the way that that team operates, the way that that group operates, and having having your best players be a part of your team and calling those players in 100%. Gordo, we live in crazy times right now. What are things looking like in the real estate market? Oh, Dax, you know that rates are always going to be the best with Synergy One Lending, and those are always going to fluctuate. But one thing that never fluctuates, that's the service you get with Erin from Bikes Realty Group. She is the number one agent I will refer all my clients to. She handles all the obstacles up front, really takes the stress out of any transaction and move that you have. Check out my girl Erin Mishu with Bikes Realty Group at majorleague-realestate.com. The, the only other piece that I wanted to touch on is why we don't have a clear number nine. Why does this country not have a goal scorer? Do That's you have any goal any theories? Goal scorer with the mustache? Youth system, baby. Youth system. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, uh, we got to... We, we, I we threw need... this out, and I was thinking about this. Um, I, do you feel like... I think it actually may have something to do with the youth system in terms of everybody... I feel like everyone, and, and this was brought up, this is not mine, brought up that everyone plays a 4-3-3 now. And now that we don't have two front runners, which like the goal, the number nine, the goal scorer used to be the most attractive position on the field. And now it's literally used for tap ins. And that's it. All you do is you chase down center backs and you pressure them one direction or the other. And you finish off beautiful build out from the back into the into the middle of the field up to the final third. Oh, but and what, then, what else do you want your number nine to do? Guards? What do I what, what do else I, what, what else do you want him to do? He's scoring want, goals. <laughs> no, I'm good with him scoring goals. I'm just saying the position has completely changed from being this like attractive, massive piece of the game to now you like, like nines touch the ball maybe 20 times, 20 touches a game, and they run around and score Good goals man. and take all the credit and right. lift the trophies and, and kiss the pretty girls. But like, still like, here's a hot I, take for you. We don't have a number nine problem. The, uh, the only issue is that our best number nine was injured for this camp and he's a redhead. How about that? You like that take Garks? Josh, Ooh, Sergeant. Josh Sergeant, Sergeant is our best number nine. That's You've been drinking this morning. Absolutely not. <laughs> have you seen him play the last year? I have I not, and I, well. I, I, uh, I haven't. I shouldn't Look, say that. I, I have I seen him play. I don't. Watch I do. Him. I do like him a lot. I do I think he's a, a very I talented player. Regularly, but... but I've seen his goals, and his goals are a combination of all different types of goals. He scores in transition. He scores headers. Mm -hmm. He scores right foot. Mm -hmm. He scores left foot. Mm -hmm. He scores opportunistic goals. He finds the ball in good spots. He's just an opportunistic player who's in a really, really good vein of form right now. And don't get me wrong. I, I think Haji Wright is fantastic. I think he's playing at a high level right now. I think Bolligan is a very, very good player who I think is struggling a little bit. He's gone through a little bit of dip in form. I think he's with Monaco. J Josh Sargent, for me, and I always liked him, even when he was really young, when, when I saw him play for some of the youth national teams, I think that he is a throwback to the striker that you're talking about, Dan. The guy who can do a little bit of everything. He can hold the mm -hmm. ball. He can play and co he can combine with the other players. And then he gets in the box. He makes good runs. He's a good finisher. So for me, like, I, I don't, I don't know how old Josh Sargent is, but I think he's still relatively young, 23, 24, he's playing at a high level in the championship. And I don't know if he's that young, but he is playing at a high is, level. He's the main man at a team who is fighting for promotion and he is playing at a high level. So look, I think that Josh Sargent needs to be in the next, 
round of international games. Hopefully he's healthy. And I think he needs 24. to go, he's 24 years old. So I think he needs to get a run and like a significant run with some of our best players, guys like Gio, guys like Christian, guys like Tim Weah. Right. And I think if you start to build a rapport with him and these other guys, he's at a great age to be able to contribute at a really high level in the 2026 world cup. So boom, there you go. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think we're it. looking for, I don't think we're looking for number nines. And I was joking about this youth thing, but we don't, we don't, we don't train. We don't, we don't train our forwards. Like maybe we used to, and you bring up a good point. There's no, there's no solid focus on because we're, we're running with the high wingers. You know, there's less of an important, uh, an importance to be that tall post up, you know, number nine. So every, every, every youth camp you go to, I mean, what is, what is like, everybody's focused on possession. Possession, Everybody's possession, focused possession. on building out of the back, and think about the way that we used to back. start. Think about the way that we used to start the game. It was a six that went long up into the Dark. striker. Can you how, kick it as right. far as you can? Yeah, and we and we don't we don't do it anymore. And so there's there's not this. The kids aren't getting the, the training or the mindset of being a big number nine and and finishing that that craft. That's this is the thing. YouTube generation. Everybody wants to be a, a Messi or a Ronaldo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true. I do. Uh, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I definitely don't want to be Gordo. Right. How do you feel? No. But how do you feel about the fact that like most of our number nines, from what I've seen, they actually play better when they're playing off of another striker. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I are we are we just missing the boat here with this whole four three three? Like, is there an adjustment there? Because I, to I your point, Dax, so. I don't think we so. got a we ton do. of. We do have a ton of strikers that are kind of yeah. in this pool that. Are we are we really maximizing our talent the, to the best ability? I think for the most part, if you're gonna if you're if you're talking about maximizing talent and building around your best players, like we were with Toronto a little bit earlier mm -hmm. with Cine Bernadeschi, Christian Pulisic is best and most comfortable on the left, playing out wide yep. as a winger, yep. and and Gio Reyna is best and most comfortable as a free roaming number ten who can go find the game. Like, yep, you, you can't unless you, you can't play with those two guys in their favorite roles and still play with two strikers. You can't do it. Yeah. I just don't well, see, unless you're going to play some sort of hybrid of a three, four, three, where you give Christian freedom to like roam inside and go outside. Right. Like I just don't see a, a, a role for or a formation that would suit what you want. Well, it's, a, it's also, it's really hard for the number nine. And, and I know this is kind of what we're alluding to in this system, because it, as for for a number nine to be banging in goals because that's all he's asked to do is get in the mm -hmm. box and finish right mm -hmm. but the way the players that we have on the wings how many crosses do you think that they get in in a game not yeah, many not a ton no not a ton there's not a lot of chances so these these number nines are trying to do their thing but it's it's literally you either score or you've done nothing so mm -hmm. it's really easy for us to say, you know, to look at their, you know, their game, if they don't, if they're not on the score sheet, you're like, well, what do you even do? Why don't right. we have a number nine? Because there's, there's no use for them. They're not doing anything unless they want to come all the way back and get some touches <laughs> on the ball, right? Like Gio Reyna, you're going to see, you're going to see our number nine taking the ball off the center backs at some point. He's like, dude, I never get the ball. It's like, but, what, it's like what Thierry used to do at Red Bull. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. Saying, all his midfielders it. stank. He would just come and get the ball off the center back yeah. and pull the ball all the way up the field. <laughs> So I, th I think it, I think I think it's tough, man. I think it's really tough. I would love to see some striker combinations, and if that means pulling Geo off the field for a little bit or pushing Pulisic into a different position, at least in in the build up here, because I do think that we've never seen this much talent in a national team pool ever, and and it is it far exceeds anything that we've ever had. I mean, the guys that are sitting on the bench, it's it's pretty wild because they are starters of former world cups hands down. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate it. I wouldn't hate it to see Greg kind of tinker with that and see what it looks like. Last piece I want to touch on is the referee situation apparently has been resolved as of this morning. Dax, who blinked? Was it MLS or was it PSRA? If I had to guess, I would say MLS blinked. I I would probably agree with you. I just Gordo, would you agree? What does blinking mean? 
it means who went back to because well hey, last week Gar- Garber said hey we're gonna go we're gonna go through the World Cup with these yeah. referee these replacement referees and then all of a sudden there's an announcement did I did <laughs> I did find it somewhat interesting at the end of the press release um, the quote <laughs> I don't and I'm gonna butcher this because I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't write it all down but Rodriguez Nelson Rodriguez who's the senior VP of MLS the one that put out the statement. He thanked the players and the fans and everybody else for their professionalism through this process. Thanking us, which is I, I couldn't tell, I couldn't decide if that was like, hey, this is our fault, or another subtle dig at the referees, as in you guys are you guys are clowns. But it, it was the problem welcome. is you, we, needed, you, needed, you needed less referee controversies throughout these couple weeks, and you just kept getting more and more and more. And the public sentiment and the momentum was on the ref's side. And they yeah. were all probably hanging out somewhere at ref camp, you know, doing their beat tests and slamming beers and being like, ah, oh, look at this guy. He screwed up. <laughs> being like, all right, we're good. So, look, I, no, honestly. I think- Ref camp, nachos and beep tests. <laughs> hey, I think I think MLS probably did based off of last member last week. How many blunders there were? What what yeah. game was that we were talking please, about? Please I mean, do not take your beanie off for the rest of this episode. My God, <laughs> no, stop, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good if you guys that are listening, is, you're missing out. You are missing out. This is uh, why you got to tune into the YouTube stream. Listen, I, uh, in all seriousness, I'm really happy that they did come to an agreement. I, I, I think that, um, honestly, most of the replacement referees, they did a commendable job for as long as they could. And it just kind of, the consistency just wasn't there. And so now that you get the main refs back, I think it's positive for all parties involved. But hey, let's be honest. Me a lot of eyeballs on the refs now. Yeah. You're going to yeah. have to be on it from the first whistle or else... If you ask for more money, you got to profile raise. That's right. That's right. The expectations increase. Well, I I think it, everybody is is stoked to have them back. So I, it's good. I'm glad that they came to resolution. Sounds at least like they're going to move forward. No, Seven years. Gordo, is a, Gordo, put your beanie back on. That is a long. That's a long time. Seven year commitment. But good. Good to see it. Job well done. MLS referees. Thank you for. Uh, for finding common ground because we appreciate it and you are welcome for our professionalism throughout the process. Journeyman, it's been fun. Great to see you. Gordo, don't break a leg. Uh, you got already two replacement hips. You don't need a new knee. Uh, Dax, good luck this weekend. We'll see you out there, everybody. 